um i i'm not sure yaar i mean try maine to kar diya yeah maine kar diya chal raha hai mera tab bhi sab kuch listening to the webinar before i begin you know something about students for liberty so students for liberty is a rapidly growing network of pro liberty students from all over the world our mission is to educate develop and empower the next generation of leaders for liberty we also provide support to students and student organizations dedicated to ideas for liberty uh you can check out our website and see our efforts in various regions of the south asian uh, continent we've done some amazing work in nepal and india and also bangladesh uh for students for liberty a freedom means economic freedom social freedom intellectual and academic freedom we support students and student organizations to learn more about ideas for liberty by providing educational resources such as the seminar and trainings to help them elevate the quality of their activism i would highly encourage you to check out our latest online course produced in collaboration with learn liberty it's called liberty 101 it's a short course that covers topics in philosophy economics and law for a more rigorous learning experience and this i would uh, personally recommend i would highly highly ask you to uh, apply for the local coordinator program as you can see on our website um it's fairly simple to apply for the local coordination program it's open all the year round uh the program has a four week long academic training that discusses the philosophy of liberty from various approaches along with a leadership training by the end of it uh, you'll also be invited for a fully sponsored retreat in your own region and you'll be able to meet some excellent people uh who are advocates for liberty and who've been doing amazing work in their region about today's webinar We have Mr. Tanu Day, and he's going to talk about rules and not rulers, and how they're the foundations of a prosperous society. The importance of rules in the prosperity of nations is much greater than the influence of leaders. A good set of rules, consistently followed, is a necessary condition for the wealth of nations. Mr. Tanu Day is going to contend that rules matter more than rulers. Mr. Tanu Day is a leading economist. His primary areas of interest are economic development, public choice, and constitutional economy. He received his PhD in economics from UC Berkeley. He is also an alumnus of IIT Kanpur, Rajasthan University, and holds degrees in engineering and computer science. We can also check out his website. It's atamiday.com. I'm giving the floor over to Mr. Tanuday. So, uh, it's a great pleasure to invite you over to this webinar. uh i give you the floor uh <clears throat> thank you shri for that introduction and for that introduction to what uh, students for liberty to stand for i uh, would like to talk today about the importance of rules and why rules matter more than rulers in any complex economy the the way the economic game is played depends upon the rules that the participants in the economy agree on and most of the time these rules are encoded in some kind of a formal constitution and this constitution is the fun foundation upon which uh, the the game of uh, the economic uh, is uh, the economic game is played so in the case of um, india we have a constitution which um, is uh, was uh, created around uh, the time of india's independence from british uh, rule in around 1947 so we need to understand that india's prosperity is directly related to the fact that the constitution plays uh, plays uh, places the people of india as um as subservient to the government of india and there's a reason why the constitution is uh, has uh, uh, has placed the government <laughs> as the master and the people as uh, as as the, the servants of 
uh, of the government because of um, the colonial legacy that um, the Indian uh, nation has had. Now, this relationship between the government and the people is one of master and slave which is exactly the opposite of what it is in the case of the uh, country like the United States. It's also a democracy like India, but the constitution makes the people as the principal and the government as its agent. And that makes a difference in terms of how much liberty and freedom the people enjoy in the United States as compared to in India. In India, we know that the rules make it so that the people have to seek permission from those people in government and those permissions are uh, granted based upon the discretion, discretion of the people in government and that causes a lot of economic friction. So fundamentally the fact that India is not prosperous as it could be, the contention is that India is not as prosperous as it could be because Indians are not free. And Indians are not free because the Indian constitution puts the government as the principal and the people as its agents. And that relationship requires that Every time the people are interested in doing something, they have to seek permission and the government actually then extracts uh, and exploits the people for its own benefit. So that is the basic idea that if the rules are not good, then regardless of who the rulers are, prosperity is going to elude us. Muted and the rules are encoded in the constitution. And with that brief introduction to this idea that the rules matter not the rulers, I'd like to take uh, questions and comments from the listeners. Uh the floor, as I just messaged you, is now open for questions. You can either raise your hand, or the option is given on the top of your screen, or you can type in your questions. Are we uh, getting any questions so far or um, maybe to get this started? We uh, have a question. So we have a question. Um, so Sadar Shukran is asking, what is the major difference between the Indian and the US constitution? Uh, and who was the uh, person who was asking the question please? Sadar, Sadar Hussain. I'll just okay. unmute him. Yeah. Hello. Sadar. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Tanu. Hello. Please go on. I'm listening. Yes. Yeah, so my question was, um, though we do uh, agree and we, we say that um, um, Indian Constitution is just a waste book, of waste paper, basically. Um, but how would you justify, um, and what would you say uh, as a, as a major difference between Indian and U.S. Constitution? Apart from what you have already said that in the in, in US Constitution, government is more like a servant or agent as compared to Indian where people are servant or agent. What the other thing that, that you would point out as a major difference? Excellent question. So, um, like you, you also repeated, um, you know, stress the point that the relationship between the government and the people is exactly opposite of what between the Indian and the US Constitution. Yeah. The thing is, the Indian Constitution uh, places what is called um, 
justice as equity as the driving principle in the Indian Constitution. And in the American Constitution, what drives the thing is individual liberty. That is, liberty precedes everything else. That individuals are free to follow their own interests, their um, you know their happiness and and so on, their prosperity and happiness and, and that. So, what happens is in the context of India, the what is called uh, justice as equity is the driving principle. So they say that if in the in the quest or the search for just justice and equity, we have to uh, suppress individual liberty, we'll go and do it. So in the case of India, the constitution says people have right to property or right to free speech, but in the in the search for justice as equity, we might suppress that. The government can say, no, you will not have freedom of property, I mean the right to property or the, the freedom of speech or the right to free speech because it will not promote justice for equity. Okay. So that's a, a fundamental difference. Nehru said that basically the constitution is a creature of the parliament and the parliament is supreme because it represents the will of the people. Mm -hmm. So basically the idea is that whatever the will of the people is, the majority gets reflected in the rules and laws that the parliament passes and therefore the individual is not at the center of our, our interest. What it, what is at interest is whatever the majority wants. Okay. That's a critical di distinction between the two countries. Okay. Thank you. Do we have other questions? All right, so I think we can proceed. I can proceed? Yes, sir. Yeah. You know, one of the things that we need to recognize is that human beings are, any collective of human beings are pretty much similar to each other. That is, people who, um, people as collectives are different in some sense, but the differences is not that important, uh, that much that is reflected in the prosperity of the various nations. For example, we know that, uh, say, Germany is more prosperous than, say, uh, Somalia. And we can say that um, that is because the geography of Germany, the history, the culture, the, the climate of these places are different. And therefore, you can reasonably expect that there will be some differences in their level of prosperity. But the contention here is that even accounting for the differences in climate and geography and various other things, the differences in the prosperity of the two nations are quite stark and much more than what can be explained. Indeed, you can take two societies or two countries which have the same climate, the same cultural and historical precedents and the same kind of uh, people in it and still they are different in their prosperity. Let's take an example of East Germany and West Germany. Before the Germanys were united and that is post the Second World War, East Germany and West Germany immediately after the Second World War were pretty much equal to each other because it was the same country and it got divided. But after some time, after a couple of decades, you could see that there was a difference in the prosperity between East and West Germany. Similarly, you can see that Korea was divided into North and South Korea. And South Korea proceeded to become a very pros prosperous nation, first world nation, whereas North Korea is not 
so prosperous relative to South Korea. So if the history is the same, the kind of people are the same, the culture is the same, what accounts for the differences in the prosperity between these two countries, uh, between separate regions of the same country? And that is that the different set of rules were used between the two. So therefore it underlines the fact that it is the rules that make the difference among countries and it's not anything, I mean there are other differences but other causal factors but the rules are the very very important determining factors. But then you have to ask yourself where do the rules come from? The rules themselves are in some sense evolved within the the country. They are not something that uh, in general get imposed from outside. So is it possible to change the rules and how can we change the rules? Those are critical questions. In the case of India, we have a constitution that was um, created and came into effect in some time in 1949, I think, November 1949 or 1950. So I'd like to ask a question of the, the attendees of this, uh, this webinar. How many of you have actually read the Indian Constitution? Unmuted. If anyone has read the Constitution, you can just raise your hand and we would count that. There's one person raising their hand, so no, out of 11 people that we have here. Yeah. Two Excellent. People. So now let me ask this person who has uh, raised uh, his or her hand. Uh, how big is the, Const the Constitution of India? Sukanti, so, you're unmuted. Uh, you can unmute yourself and... Uh... Let's discuss that. Oh, no, I haven't raised my hand on Google webinar. Okay. The uh, other person... Sadaf has also raised his hand. Sadaf, you're... Uh... It's a fat book. I don't remember how many pages were there. Uh, but what I know is it, it has got around 100 plus amendments since 1950. Excellent. You're quite right. So the thing is, the Indian Constitution is the longest constitution, written constitution in the world. It is, uh, in certain publications, you'll find it more than 500 pages. And it is extremely difficult for a non-expert or a non-legal person to read and understand because it is very complicated language. It is in legalese. It would say like section this, notwithstanding that, and, and article so and so. It's pretty complicated. It's not easy for a lay person to read. Sure. And like I said, it's depending on how you read it, it takes about 500 pages or more. Now con contrast this with the American Constitution. The American Constitution is, in the original, it was of course handwritten because it was um, written around the 1780s, more than 220 years ago, 230 years ago. You know, how many handwritten pages? It was 400 pages is the entire American Constitution. It is read by every schoolboy, I mean school school going student in the United States. And it is so short that it is often added at the end of dictionaries. It's just about a few pages long. So the, what happens then, since it's written in plain English, you anyone can read it and understand it and then decide whether what's going on is consistent with what the Constitution says or it is not constant consistent. So you can make decisions based, you can agree or disagree with the constitution, but in the case of Indian, the Indian constitution, nobody ever can agree or disagree unless you're an expert. The average person cannot, and I'm an average person, I cannot, 
understand what the constitution fundamentally says. So that's a very critical difference between the United States Constitution and Indian Constitution. That one is a constitution that the people can understand, the other is a constitution that only experts after years of study can understand it. And I have asked at least 10,000 Indians, educated Indians, if they have read the constitution and every time I have not found a single person who has actually admitted to reading the entire constitution. Some people raise their hands and say, yeah, yeah, I have read the constitution and then upon closer inquiry, they say that, well, I read the preamble and somebody says I read parts of it because it was required in my courses and so on. That is a very, very damning indictment of the Indian constitution that Indians have not read the constitution. And I can tell you one more thing that I don't think any of the lawmakers, quote unquote lawmakers in India, which are members of parliament and uh, Raj Sabha and Lok Sabha and the legislative assembly people in various states, I don't think anybody has read the constitution. Well, I would like to get some comments from the attendees on this point. I think uh, the point that Sir recently made about how the American Constitution is so short that it, it is uh, printed at the back of every dictionary and is handed down to every schoolboy like, during his classes. Uh, all I can think of is during my school uh, period, all I ever read was the preamble. And that is all that was ever told to me about the Indian Constitution. And had I yep. not entered law, I think that is the only part of the constitution that I would have thought that it exists. We were not even properly told that it is around 395 articles long. All I knew was that this is the preamble and this is what the Indian constitution look, looks like. And I think this goes for majority of Indians. Right. So the thing is that a constitution is the foundation upon which all the other rules are made. And if the people don't know what the constitution says, it does not make much sense um, to say that we are a republic because a republic is fundamentally something that is there's a constitution and then the people agree to the constitution. They, they say that yes, we we know what the constitution says and we agree to it and those are the and the rules that get framed as a consequence of the constitution get implemented and therefore we have a bit of a problem we don't know what the constitution says but we do know that the constitution allows certain things to go on in this society for example if the constitution were to debar everyone who was a criminal from ever contesting in elections, then we won't have um, criminals in our um, in in positions of power. Excuse me for a second, please. Hello. Just a second. I'll take this moment to um, tell you guys that whenever you need to ask a question, you can either raise your hand and uh, I'll unmute you, or you can okay. type your question in the question box. Over to Sir now. All right. All right. Come on, I'm back. All right, sir. We can resume. Um. Yeah, so uh, let's, uh, are there any questions so far? No, sir, none so far. You may proceed.
Hello. You may proceed, sir. All right. So so far we have been talking about um, the fact that the American Constitution is quite different from the Indian Constitution. One of the the defining characteristic is that the American Constitution is short, can be understood by people, and the Indian Constitution is very long and has been not, not read by people. That's one thing, that's a superficial difference. The more fundamental difference is that the American Constitution places the relationship between the government and the people differently from the Indian thing. The reason is that in the case of the Indian Constitution, the Indian Constitution is basically something that was uh, framed around the uh, Government of India Act of 1935, which was created by the, the British Parliament, actually. And therefore, it's a continuation of British rule. And in, in the case of the fact that the British were the colonial powers in India, they made the rules so that government was all powerful and the people had very limited powers. In the case of the American uh, Constitution, the American Constitution was written in such a way that they wanted to reject the British monarchical system. And to reject the British monarchical system, they said, we are going to create a system where we do not have the government as the all-powerful thing, but the people as the principles and the government is just an agent which is deliberately made less uh, you know its powers are weakened by distributing the power between three different parts of the government which is the judiciary the executive and the legislature and the legislature itself is divided into two bits which is called the senate and the house of representatives so therefore the framers of the American Constitution were very, very deliberate in their act. They said they were scared of big government. They did not trust big government and they did not trust democracy. See, democracy is about the rule of majority over the men or over the rest. And they were very, very, scared, uh, very um, wary about the rule of the majority. And therefore, you notice that the word democracy does not appear in the Declaration of Independence, neither in the Constitution of the United States. And it's a very important telling point that um, the United States is a republic and not a democracy, if you look at the specific definition of the two words. So the question then would be, why is it that a constitution which limits the power of the government leads to a prosperous prosperous society as opposed to a constitution which gives almost unlimited power to the government uh, relative to the people that's the that's a question we need to address so let's hear some of the attendees talk about this uh, um, why don't we try to address this question? Why is it that a constitution that, that why is it that a very powerful government can lead to less prosperity than a society where the government is not very powerful and the people are? So we have Sadaf again um, asking a question. Sadaf, oh, you're unmuted now. <laughs> Um, so the question that I wanted to ask is um, that we are talking about uh, Government of India Act, uh, with how Britishers made this to control uh, Indians when they were ruling us, when they were governing us. Um, and of course, we all know that uh, the Indian Constitution again is not well thought of. Um, and they adopted almost two, for the lack of better word, sections I'm using from Government of India Act. So, so they, they adopted almost 250 plus sections of uh, Government of India Act. Um, to make it uh, uh, and to put that put those act sections in Indian constitution, and uh, so what was the reason uh, when they wanted to become an independent democracy, when they wanted to uh, at least the intention was to give power to individuals and not a concentrated power to the government. Yep. Am I clear with the question? 
Yeah, so you say you are you're not asking a rhetorical question, you're asking a real question saying why did they do this? Include 250 plus articles from the Government of India Act. Is that the question? Yes, that's the question. Yeah, see, um, I suspect, and this is a, uh, just a guess, that what happened was they, the people who took over after the British were supposed to leave, decided that the system that the British had created was had, had kept the country in some kind of stability. And they said that instead of uh, rewriting things and changing systems all over the place, uh, just so that this country can function the way it was functioning before 1947, August 1947, let's just to keep the functioning going, let's keep all the systems in place but now that the British are gone, we are now the masters of our destiny. We will do the controlling. The British used to control, now we are doing the control, so now we'll keep everything in place. Basically, they said, let's not uh, mess around with the, with the me mechanism that has been working. Let things the way it is, and so they get on, got on with it, with the uh, Constitution exactly the way um, you know the constitution allowing the the British rule to continue the without the Britishers. So it was the same game with new players. Yeah, the rules were the same, and therefore, you see what would happen is if I were to put myself in the place of the people who took over control of India in 1947. I would be happy with the system as it was because the British used to control India, now I am in control. So if I was uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, I would do exactly what Jawaharlal Nehru did. He said that, okay, the British have left, the kings are, the king is dead, long live the king kind of a deal. <laughs> okay. The point is, and this is something that I repeat often, British Raj ended in 1947, British Raj 2.0 started in 1947. It's a new incarnation of the old rule. And if India didn't prosper under British Raj, it is unlikely or it was un unreasonable of us to expect that India would prosper under British Raj 2.0 because the government was still in control. And we have to remember that government is not like some abstract entity out there which has great wisdom and uh, they are all for the public good and uh, they look for truth and beauty and what is good for everybody. They are people like every one of us. They are people like Lalu Prasad Yadav. They are people like Nitish Kumar. There are people like Manmohan Singh. They are just like the, like the rest of us, which we are self-interested, self-motivated. We'd like to do stuff for them, our, ourselves, our family, our kith and kin. So they, they do the things that's good for them. They don't do stuff for what is good for the country. Now, that is not to say that some leaders don't do that, what is good for the country. That depends upon the leaders, and the leaders, whether we get a good leader or a bad leader, is a bit of a uh, trap shoot. It's uh, it's a toss up. It's a random draw. For example, I'll take uh, my favorite example is a small city state called Singapore. In Singapore, by chance, they got a guy called Lee Kuan Yew, who was an authoritarian, dictatorial person. And he transformed Singapore from a mosquito-ridden swamp within a generation, 25 years or 30 years, he made it into a world-class city. And then later on, Lee Kuan Yew could uh, boast, he said that Singapore became rich, but we did not. We, when Lee Kuan Yew was saying we, he meant the leaders of Singapore did not become rich. In the case of India, they can make an exactly opposite they said we became rich, but India didn't become rich. 
and there's a relationship you know if the leaders become rich the country suffers and vice versa that if the country becomes rich the, the leaders cannot become rich for the simple reason that there is a relationship between the two anyway um, let's see let me check the time it is 8 um, 838 um, let me take some comments or questions or observations from the 12 attendees that we have on this uh, web webinar um, I have a question sir uh, why we do agree that uh, the rules of Lord and that for a prosperous society to function the rules should be changed uh, many people tend to contend that uh, for a democracy the system of elections and voting for representatives and since that they, they are the representatives they're supposed to um, follow the majority follow the uh, take into account the choices of the individuals that they are representing and that this system is in place to change the rules and the same representatives are supposed to change the constitution they're supposed to change the laws they're supposed to amend the constitution they're supposed to amend the laws and uh, this is enough uh, would you agree that this is not enough and maybe perhaps something uh, uh, like a referendum system should be in place so that the rules are changed in tandem with uh, the population or do you think something other than all of these extra constitutional measure, or measures are required? Um, it's a very good question that you ask. The important thing to remember is that in a republic it's not the majority that rules. The sovereign is not a majority. That's a democracy and democracy basically is about what the majority feels. So if 99 or 51% of a population feels something then that becomes the law. But in a republic, it's the constitution. See, a society or a nation or a state needs a government because people need to be protected from other people's arbitrary action. And a constitution is required so that the people are protected from arbitrary rule by the government. So there are a set of rules that we need to have. Now these rules cannot be changed at the whim of the majority because if the minority is not protected and the minority is exactly the minority of an individual it's not you can't decide that the majority feels this way and therefore the minority should be oppressed. Now in the case of India we, we have to recognize that the rules were made so that the government was the ruler and the people were subservient to the government and that's right for a colonial country but for a free country the government should be an agency of the people and not the, the ruler of the people. How are we going to reconcile a free country with a colonial constitution is the problem. It is a difficult thing to reconcile and therefore the colonial government had ruled over India based upon certain notions about how to divide the country you know make uh, divisions within society but in India we need to have uh, non-discrimination government should not have the power to discriminate it should not have the power to take from one section and give to another section which is what it does right now if you see what happened in Bihar recently in the elections, it was based on caste. Why is it that caste politics rules India? It is because when you become, when you get in charge of the government, you can discriminate amongst your citizens based on caste. Suppose there was a rule in the Indian constitution that says you cannot discriminate amongst people based on caste. Then it doesn't matter which caste person gets to be the chief minister of Bihar because he is constitutionally prevented from making rules that discriminate between Yadavs and non-Yadavs. 
Do you see what I mean? It means that if there is a constitutional uh, bar, a uh, barrier against discrimination, then there would not be any caste politics in India. Over to you, Sri. Hello. So I have a question. Uh, you uh, mentioned about how there was a distribution of powers in the U.S. Uh, when the U.S. Constitution was being written between the uh, several states and between the judiciary and the legislature, uh, and there were two houses in the legislature. But so a similar uh, distribution of power exists in India as well, with the difference that the center has more power in India. Uh, how do you think? These constitutional these constitutional checks on the power of the government have worked out. Okay, could you hold on for just a second, please? I I need to uh, take a quick break uh, because of this thing. Hold on, huh? Sure. Hello, I'm back. Yes, sir. Yeah, sorry. Um, there was somebody at the door, and so I'm the only one at home. I had to uh, attend to the door. That's so, deal, right? um, just to um, reiterate, can you tell me, uh, uh, repeat your question, please? Yes. Uh, so, uh, briefly, the, the question was about how the distribution of powers has played out in India. I mean, we also have a legislature, the two houses in the legislature, and, you know, uh, it's uh, we also have states having some powers. Those the center has more power in India than in the U.S. Uh, how do you think this these constitutional checks on the power of the government have played out? Well, it seems that uh, the constitution constitutional checks on the power of the government have not been adequate for the simple reason that the constitution then allows the government to amend the constitution to what the government of the day feels like amending it to. So suppose, like in the United States, what happens is that the Supreme Court of the United States as one branch of the three uh, branches of government, that is Supreme Court as the judiciary, then the legislator and the executive, the Supreme Court can look at whatever laws that, that the legislature is passing and uh, rule whether it's constitutional or not. That's in the case of the United States. In India, the Supreme Court can say, by the way, the law that you just passed was not constitutional, and then the legislature goes and changes the constitution and say, okay, now the law that we made is now constitutional. So they can go and change the constitution. The legislature can go and change the constitution easily enough that whatever the legislation they pass, if the Supreme Court says this is not constitutional, they will just go and amend the constitution to make the law constitutional. So it doesn't work very well in the case of India. 
so 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 uh, india has had a lot of constitutional amendments i once calculated that in the united states they have one constitutional amendment every 15 years and in the case of india they have one constitutional amendment every 6 months yeah go on so i was saying uh, if you could address the larger point about why uh, giving more power to the state vis a vis the individual is a roadblock in the prosperity of a nation like so ah okay very good question so let's just conclude with that question why is it that if the state has a lot of power then the individual at the uh, relative to the individual then then it does not lead to prosperity and this is a very critical question why is it that if individuals in a society have freedom to do what they want to do then the society prospers as opposed to in societies where the state has control over the individual and the individual is subservient to the state that it does not lead to prosperity this is a very very kind of a universal law you have never found a state where this you have never found an economy where the state is very powerful and uh, and dictates to the individual what to do what he or she can do why is it that those those economies don't prosper the answer to that is that what is it that creates wealth in a society fundamentally what is it that creates wealth what creates wealth is human action voluntary exchange between between parties in any society now this voluntary exchange increases welfare both sides it increases it creates wealth Uh, if you prevent voluntary exchange you impose exchanges that is you both prevent ex- some voluntary exchanges and impose certain other kinds of exchanges you will never get the same kind of increase in wealth or welfare or increase in subjective value as you would have had if the exchanges were entirely voluntary it it is only when you when the people are free to do exchanges will there be prosperity do i answer oh, your oh. question adequately uh yes sir and um Jeez. when so the we state have one last becomes, question I'm sorry uh, please go ahead Shri So I'm sorry to uh, interrupt uh, you can please go on we had just one last question uh, from Simran Hello Yeah go on go on please Yeah So sir uh, Simran is asking um she wants to know the basic difference between the constitution of the United States of America and ours in the sense that even USA she says makes decisions on what rules to make which will be helpful for the common people i think that even they have a set of people who are deciding so in that sense how is the constitution of the united states different from that of the indian constitution i have just unmuted simran she can probably clarify uh, something to what on it she has in the yeah please um uh, hello yeah um yeah, she she mostly told what my view was as in even they have a set of people who are deciding on you know they're not taking the common people or they're not taking the vote of the common people as such for any decision so how is the constitution of usa any different or any better than ours or the constitution of india okay so 
the, the constitutions of the United States and India are quite different, as I said, in two specific uh, areas. One is the constitution of the United States is a very, very limited, small constitution. Okay? That is, it's only about uh, a few thousand words long, whereas the Indian constitution is like a hundred thousand words long. You can't read it over a couple of weeks, whereas the United States constitution you can read in about ten minutes. Or just sit around and read it. Ten minutes. It's written in English, so you can understand it very easily. Indian Constitution, you cannot understand because it's written legally. That's the first difference. The second difference is that the Indian Constitution puts restrictions on what the people can do. It is. It restricts the people, whereas the American Constitution puts restrictions what the government can do. That is, if you look at the First Amendment of the American Constitution, the first five words of the First Amendment of the American Constitution says, Congress shall make no law. Okay, those five words. That is, it is saying you cannot make a law for the X, Y, and Z. I mean, the whole First Amendment is only 43 words long. It says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, etc., etc., etc. Whereas the Indian Constitution, the First Amendment, is 1,700 words long. And basically it deals with, among other things, the freedom of speech. It says Indians have the freedom of speech provided they say what they say does not, the government agrees with it. That is, you only allowed to say what? You want to say, provided the government agrees with you. Whereas the American Constitution says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of expression and speech. You see, that's the difference. One says, government is all powerful, and the people will say, only, people are only allowed to do what the government allows them to do. That's the Indian Constitution. The American Constitution says, the government is only allowed to do certain things that the people have allowed the government to do. The people are the rulers in the American context and in the Indian context, the government is the ruler. That's the difference. So when American lawmakers make laws, they have to pay attention to what the Constitution says. The Constitution says you cannot make this law or that law. Whereas in the case of India, the rulers or the people who make the laws are completely at, they have the freedom to law, make whatever laws they want. They can do whatever they want because the constitution allows them to, that gives them the power to do that. Simran, did, did I address your question? Simran, you've been unmuted. Yes, sir, you cleared my question. Thank you so much. All right. You're welcome. So, um, anyway, any other questions, points, discussions, um, points of order? Hello, Sri. Uh, yes, sir, it doesn't seem like there are any yeah. more questions. Uh, we're not getting any raised hands or any questions in the question box. So, um, I guess that's it from the audience, sir. All right. So, uh, great. So, let's uh, conclude this uh, webinar. Yeah. Um, Shri. Okay. Okay. Um I think the talk today was not something that one would get to hear very often. You would not, if you're in law school, people would not tell you that your constitution is flawed. And if you're not in law school, you probably never would even hear about the constitution. And which is why I think it's very important to know that for our society to prosper, it would not do to just sit at home and criticize political parties or the leaders. What we should see is that 
there are constitutions and that there are rules that are empowering these people to be who they are being. I think Mr. Atanu Day was excellent in proving this point tonight. Uh, sir, it was uh, excellent to have you as a speaker for Ideas for Liberty. We are so glad that uh, you could feature uh, in the archives for libertarian discussions for the South Asian uh, libertarian students. Uh, we hope that you would continue to uh, support us. Uh, everyone, I am so glad that you could make it. You can email your comments uh, to sagnihotri at studentsforliberty.org. Um, I would also encourage you to join the local coordinator program and meet people with similar views. Thank you, people. Good night. Thanks, uh, uh, Shri. Thank you very much for uh, arranging this, and thanks for all the uh, thanks to all the attendees. And I'm glad to be part of this. And thanks much, very much. Thank you, sir. Okay. Good night. Good night.